advocates now. So thank you, Marco, for that. I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, for me, I'm, you know, software, software testing quality has been my life basically since, you know, I, well, I would say since I learned to walk, but that's probably a little bit, a bit, a bit extreme. Um, so yeah, so I've got a lot of experience um, through manual automation and loads of other techniques as well. So I will hand you over to Oleg. Hey everyone, um, my name is Alec. I'm going to spare you my surname because it's too complicated and too many letters in the alphabet there. Um, I'm not well known, I guess, in the sort of talking talk industry or stuff. I've done a bit of blogging. Um, I'm just actually recently joined as a senior quality engineer at Kazoo, which is awesome. Um, and I kind of like to mix up um, I've, well, I've done a bit of development and moved into testing a while back, but I like to mix up the psychology and philosophy um, into actually testing and um, debate about it. So it should be interesting today. Um, Elizabeth? Thanks very much, Oleg. So I've just realized I'm um, Stuart's testing twin because I'm exactly 23 years in testing pretty much this month. So yeah, wow. Um, so it, during that time, I've been um, functional tester, non-functional tester, using automation, not using automation, using automation very badly um, as well. And yeah, I'm, I'm still here. I'm currently a an engineering manager at um, Improbable, same as Callum. And what that means is I basically build um, teams like uh, live ops, like testing, and uh, like um, engineering velocity, who do um, a lot of the support, the DevOps support, and feature infrastructure building. Um, and that's me. Great. Thank you for all the introductions, guys. Just before we do get stuck into the conversation, um, this is being recorded. Uh, so if you do have to drop off at any time for any reason, um, likewise, if any of the speakers need to drop off at any time for any reason, if we are still talking, you know, around about midnight tonight, then completely understandable. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, for now, I guess uh, a good place to start would be um, with the question of, of what does manual testing mean to you? I'll throw that question to Callum to start with. Um, and yeah, off we go. Hey, okay, I get to start off the really controversial topic of manual testing. Exciting. Okie dokes. So my view, um, as, as I stand at, here at the moment with you all as my witnesses, what's wrong with calling it manual testing? Um, we have, um, as testers, we have a very massive lexicon. Um, of, of all these different types of testing. And the one thing that we can tend to agree on is that manual testing meant doing something um, by hand rather than doing something via machine. Um, I know that it's a very contentious um, dis sort of point of, of discussion because sometimes people will say that manual testers uh, lack the, the same skill set or they are. Um, lesser in some way than other types of testers. So that's an education piece. If we as testers all agreed to say, do you know what, manual testing encompasses a number of different skills. It encompasses exploratory testing, asking questions, reviewing the documentation or, or JIRA artifacts. Maybe it involves accessibility, like security testing, maybe some tools. Um, if we looked at um, sort of that and educating that manual testing was not something that is bad because you're not an estet um, or that manual testing is like not a type of testing that we want to engage in. It could form part of a lexicon that we have that we could use to, to shorthand um, our, our testing conversations. Um, now, whether we want to shorthand it or not is another, <laughs> is another conversation entirely. But I think um, it's a very charged topic of conversation because um, a lot of people now are seeing the pendulum swing over to, we want all singing or dancing software developers who can test. And if you're a manual tester, you're left behind. We have to educate to say, Maybe I'm not an estet, but I can bring a lot to the table. Um, how do we know what we're going to automate if it's not for exploratory testing, which is manual um, until the AIs take over, um, which is a Terminator 2 plot. In a <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so effectively, I'm saying there's a, there's a lot of buzz in the industry at the moment to say, we don't call it manual development. We don't, why do we call it manual testing? 
because we don't want to call it that because we're worried that it's seen as lesser. And also we do differentiate types of development. We say front end development, we say back end development. So why don't we say this is the type of testing that I've specialized in, or I'm a jack of all trades, or I'm a starfish or a T-shaped uh, or, or whatever. Let's start having those conversations, not be afraid of saying what we are and educating people on that. I will only hear positive critique. <laughs> My, my only thing that I want to add is I think the main problem is when someone says manual testing, you immediately, or not us, but like people from the upper management, they think someone is, you know, um, less in terms of their technical skills. So they have this distinguished that, oh, you're a manual tester, you're non-technical, you're an automation tester, then you're very technical. But I've met a lot of, you know, testers who who don't necessarily have that programming language, but they know how to use the command line, they know how to navigate through the system. And that's a very technical thing. So I think, and you're right, like there needs to be a proper education, and not just within the, you know, within our craft, but you know, the other you know, types who don't really understand what testing is. And then maybe once we've done that, then we can say, okay, um, on like on this, you know, different types of activities, it's okay to say manual testing, but it's not okay to say that that's not technical because it is still a very technical um, activity. Um, I'd like to tell a little bit of a, a story at this point in time around that sort of whole perception of um automation and automators being worth more in terms of worth and, and manual being um, the lesser of the two. So I, I went into an organization. Um, please don't hate mail my boss. It wasn't the organization I'm in now. And they wanted me to build out um, a test practice. And they gave me two sets of figures for wages. And I was like, I'm building one test practice. Why is there two sets of um, figures? One was for the exploratory side of the practice I wanted to build and one was for the automation side. And I was quite, okay, I know where you're coming from. Let's, before I hire anyone or, or start creating the artifacts for the interviews or start training up people to help me um, hire this team, we're going to have a long chat, very, very long chats about sort of the value of good manual testers and what they do right across um, the quality life cycle and the amount, sheer amount of things that they touch. And again, I got to that and it, it took a while. You know, this wasn't a let's have an hour conversation or anything like that. This was over a number of weeks. First, it was to identify sort of what the quality life cycle looked like and then where um, manual testers added their value. But by the end of it, everyone in that organization sort of understood um, the value that manual testers could bring. But also um, I'm kind of, you know, a small personal win for me is that there was one set of um, recruitment salaries for um, the testers that came into that organization. And not only did I win on that field, but we grew it as a, a cross pollinated practice as well. So the automators taught um, people who had come from exploratory manual backgrounds, how to do automation, how to get started. And the automators, uh, the, the exploratory side so, taught the automators how to do exploratory testing, a, a practice that a lot of them, how to do it and plan it and report on it and, you know, um, do the charters and do the stuff that really indicate that you're doing it properly. They taught them how to do that and the automators' heads were blown. In fact, I almost think it was a harder learning curve um, for the people who were learning how to do it, uh, exploration. So, yeah, that's my little tale and my little win. I think something to sort of back it up in terms of um, the automation part where you have teams that are teaching um, odd people who are manual testers, there's been sort of a negative stories around that. Um, I've had this sort of fortunate slash misfortune of interviewing uh, some people about six months ago when I was working at Best Ticket as a QA lead. And there are people who basically may were made redundant in this day and age. Um, because they were replaced by automation industry, like um, agency, which is completely ridiculous. And these people have been working in, this is a governmental, uh, this is a governmental health system place, which is even more shocking. Um, but basically talking to them and they've been doing it for like 20 years in that industry, in that, in that company. And I was like, wow, it's impressive. You've done a lot of amazing work there. And it's like, oh yeah, but we were made redundant because we, we're not able to keep up with the demand of uh, delivery because we were manual testers. And it's like, are you kidding me? 
the experience level that they had was just incredible. And it's like, what happens? Like, oh yeah, this um, automation agency came in and I've just basically done all this BDD stuff. And I was like, wow, this is like, oh, so I'm fortunate enough to have never been ever made redundant because of this, because I've, I've basically kept up to date with the latest technology. I kind of went into automation, learned other stuff. But speaking to a lot of people throughout sort of career and interviewing or just like, you know, at a pub or whatever and finding out through communities that people are just made redundant because they're manual testers, it's just, it's been crazy. Yeah, personally, I, I hate the terms manual testers, manual testing, automation testers, automation testing, because it's all testing. And I think that one of the things that we've tried to do is remove the usage of those kind of terms because for me whether you're performing something manually whether you've automated something to do something it's just a different set of tools it's a different set of techniques that you might use to find an outcome or to explore an outcome or to explore a product i often have a lot of discussions with our engineers at dunelm now because yes we've got a lot of automation in place we've got great ci cd, CD pipelines and they're like oh, can we do away with the exploratory test now? Because we've got all this automation. And I'm like, no, guess what, guys? You can do more of it. And I'll tell you why you can do more of it, because you've automated the stuff that is essentially checking, right? So now, you're, now the guys in the teams and the developers have more time to go away and actually explore the product and really understand what they've developed, why they've developed it in that way. Um, also, you know, things like code analysis, just sitting together and eyeballing code. That's a manual technique, right? But if you called it manual testing, people would be like, whoa, hold on. Why are we doing that manually? Why are we... So trying to just change the language is really important, I think. Um, so we've tried to get away from using those types of terminologies, but um, talking more around the actual activity, i.e. exploratory or so on. So I think, and that, that, that has helped, I think, massively. Um, and we've got a mix of all sorts of skill sets, all sorts of backgrounds within our team, which is, you know, really, really important. Um, so I see that Lisa's asked there about the chances of there being jobs for manual testers that don't specify any automation. So from personal experience, Lisa, my absolute recommendation in this area would be to use social media, use blogging, use your own contacts to find people who believe in building teams of strong specialist testers who, who include exploratory or manual or, or whatever they call it um, as a skill set and recruit for that. Follow them and you make yourself known to them because I find it very hard to find um, skilled explorers when I go looking for them. I find it, I mean, I'm not saying, I find it easy to find um, um, good automators, but actually people who have a passionate um, love for that way of working, people who want to do it, people who want to understand it, people who want to self-develop themselves, they're unicorns. So if that's you, make yourself known to the people that want to hire you. There are, I promise you that, we're out there. Um, I'd like to jump on that as well. There's a cool article on Ministry of Testing blog, so you should check it out. can't remember what, what the actual quadrant is called, but when you're hiring someone, so I actually, I didn't have any experience in hiring people a long time ago, and I kind of went, I need some help, Googled some stuff, did some research, found some stuff, and then as I went on recently, and maybe a few years back, this article came out with like this quadrant of what skills you can teach, what skills you can uh, like, develop and so forth and it's been useful to see uh, to like map out over the time what skills um that are important and i like automation and like what is automation like generally just basically programming like you can learn that right but the, so there's certain soft skills that are so hard to to find basically and these are the important parts so like a lot of my story is a bit funny how I got my first quality uh, assurance job. It's, uh, it's actually from a university I was doing a development role and I kind of shifted into QA at some point. But um, I had no idea like about quality assurance or testing, like how to do it, as most probably testers are. And I sold myself to the CTO by saying like, I'm a really quick learner. I can do this. This is how I've done it. This is a project I have. I got GitHub. I've done some coding here and I can read a bit. And he was like, I don't really care about like if you can develop as long as you can like learn really quickly and you can do research and then you can just and gel with the team. 
that's what's important. And so, so by selling myself, obviously I took a junior role um, and over like three years, four years that I worked there, I've developed myself into a testing lead. That was incredible. Like, you know, you got to find these places basically like Elizabeth says. Yeah, um, just to add something as well to um to Lisa's question, um, and I know like nowadays we're just like bombarded with you know all these different keywords that you know if you're applying to be a QA engineer, like there's a lot of you know like algorithms that okay you need to have this like top you know five specific keywords, and um in a way um like I think that's actually doing more harm than good because we're actually um like trying to filter out you know people who are really good in you know manually testing or like exploring the system because we get a lot of um like applicants because i've had experience like for example i was interviewing someone and yep they know selenium you know they know cypress but then when you ask them like the actual like critical questions or like those really type of um types of question that requires creativity that requires you know like a different type of um um, type of skill their answers are you know it's it's very um like superficial it's not very you know detailed so i think like most of like the um like the really great you know manual engineers they feel that they have to learn you know how to automate because of you know like where the industry is going so i can just like resonate with um with you know um the thought that yeah it's 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 hard for you know, for a dedicated manual tester to get, you know, job nowadays without like trying to learn um, a programming language. But as Elizabeth said, like it's, you know, I guess if you make yourself like stand out from the crowd, like write blogs, build your personal brand, um, like, you know, um, write things about um, how you've advocated for quality, those types of things, I think um, those would be helpful. Yeah, I think I think it's a really, really good point, uh, Marie, in terms of we've I've done some interviews over the last 12 months for some with some very, very technically skilled and capable people. But when it comes to the mindset around quality and understanding what quality is, how you'll define it, you know, and being able to actually hold a conversation just around that topic, they've fallen down because it, it is just about being able to write the code, write some tests, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, actually how we looked at this um, and, you know, this is how I would love to think that, you know, other organizations and the industry you know, move into this direction is that, you know, we encourage some of those more technical tasks to be done by our developers, right? Alongside those highly skilled QAs, testers that, okay, they might not have the technical skills to write code, but you've got people in your teams that already write code. So why not pair up with them? Why not you know, build that relationship and actually utilize the skills you've already got and bring them together rather than always looking for somebody that can write some code over somebody that is a genuine, very good QA advocate with the right type of mindset. And, and you know, trying to get that balance is really important. So for me, you know, whilst you know, a lot of roles we advertise for is, uh, you know, yeah, if you can, if you've got some experience, technical experience, that's great. But if you haven't, often we're going to be delving into your mindset more so than whether you can write a line of code to, to automate some tests. So, you know, that's really important. So, you know, I would like to think if we can educate the industry more around this kind of stuff and ways of working, how to collaborate better, how to bring our dev and test communities more together, then this should really help overall. That's really true. Like education is is such a big part of being able to change how the these job specs look. Um, I would say um, we we know some people that uh, and some um, companies that actually understand the value that different types of testing can bring to the industry, uh, bring to their teams, and uh, they're the ones that will say we you know we want these exploratory testers. We want uh, people who with these manual testing skills. Um, we're having so many discussions still, and, and I saw um, Amit talk about, um, you know, is it testing, is it checking, uh, and all these types of conversations, and it just speaks to this level of education that's needed. Um, when, when we see job roles that are very much SDIP focused, 
we tend to see a lot of companies that are looking for all singing, all dancing people that can drop into a team and do what they think they already know they want. So um, if you want an estate, it's because you think automation is going to solve all your problems and that checking, you've got such good requirements in all, in all ways that you can just tick them all off and everything will be fine. Um, the education happens by saying, well, do you know that you want everything? Do you want to be able to do this? Do you want to be able to do that? Um, so manual testing, manual testing looks to be dead, but only because a lot of things, a lot of job specs have swung so far over to software developer and test because CICD is the big thing. And in order to do CICD, what do I need? Um, unit and integration tests, that's all I need. And we pump those out and then everything's fine, right? Silver bullet, um, which is definitely, as Amit says, the, um, the, the checking side of things. Your pipeline checks to make sure things haven't gone wrong. But what about the testing side? And we need to educate businesses. We need to advocate to say, yes, that's great. We need that. And this thing called manual testing, it's evolved. It's not the checking side of things anymore. It's the looking um, into things. It's the exploring. It's finding out what you test at your CICD pipeline level. Yeah, I kind of want to segue into that with something Christian feels sort of commented about the principles of automation and um, sort of what I found over, over the years is important to when you join a team, one of the first things that I kind of find is diagramming is so critical, understanding how infrastructure and how everything works as a whole. Don't jump in and start to do like, I'm going to build this framework. Don't try to, you know, fit a shape into a box that doesn't fit. I can't remember what the analogy is, but you get the first gist. Uh, but basically when you join, join the team, Mark is like, what? <laughs> uh, when you join the team, it's important to just basically sit down have a conversation with your architect, have a conversation with your principal engineer, have a conversation with all your um, you know, people involved and understand, sketch out the whole diagram and then see where uh, things sit and you'll kind of get that overview. And then you can start going, oh, okay, what problems am I trying to solve? What tools should I be using? And you can start you know, reading about different blogs, uh, talking to your peers um, and finding out what tools you should be using. I, to this day, I still call some of the, my peers and I even call my brother who's in DevOps. I'm like, I need some help. I, give me some advice. So. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we talk enough about you know, how to test something. You know, we, the, our testability. You know, so coming back to your point there, Oleg, like around looking at how we design something in early discussions around how are we going to test this? How are we going to build this so that we can test this? And then talk about the different ways to test it. So, you know, what are we going to automate versus what are we going to explore versus, you know, so on and so on. So, you know, that even that in those conversations is a form of, of testing, right? So we're discussing, we're exploring the design, we're, you know, so, and those sort of things get lost massively. And actually coming back to Callum's point around the CICD, CICD is actually, for me, it, it, we talk about shifting left, CICD kind of sits kind of in the middle, right? Because there's so much that happens before any, any tests get running CICD that can actually help the quality. And you know that your, your CICD should be your final set of checks, really, because everything you do up front through the conversations you have, through the exploration that you do, through the pairing that you can do, guess what? All these are done manually a lot of the time. So, you know, and then you throw it into, into the pot with where you can get those automated checks running. So I think that, you know, there's a, there's a lot to, to consider there. Um, I saw that there's also a question from Joanna about any book recommendation, tools, courses um, for people that are interested in, you know, doing more exploratory or manual testing and how they can grow. So I really, really um, am, am a big fan of Elizabeth Hendrickson's book. Um, explore it. Um, I'm still reading it and there's, you know, a lot of um, tips that, you know, she's um, like um, that she's, you know, written. Um, there's a lot of different examples and I just like that's that has to be one of um, like the number one book recommendation for anyone who really wants to go into that route. And in that book, he, um, she actually mentioned that testing is both checking and exploring. So that 
um, also uh, relates to Amit's you know, question that yeah, automating is just one side of it. You should also do the exploring part. Um, there is a, um, I think the clip is on YouTube now. If you just search for um, test flicks, um, there's a, um, there is a short clip there by um, by Erica Chestnut, and the name of the talk is "Manual Testing is Not Dead, Just a Definition." And I recommend that to you know to anyone who wants to you know understand that you know maybe we are moving away from the old way of doing manual testing, where you know we think that it's all about writing test cases, and even though. Um, the actual term of it, yeah, you know, the actual term where, you know, the whole test cases is, you know, dead, like in some cases, like the whole activity of it, like we still have to do. So I really recommend that. And I'm sure there's a lot of other, um, like, interesting, you know, courses as well in Ministry of Testing. I believe there's one upcoming course by Mike, Mikey. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name, but it's about, um, like, the cognitive biases as well and how to overcome it. So I think that will be a good, you know, um, course to learn. So it will help you, um, you know, like, explore more, you know, um, the system by having, you know, by um, eliminating all the different biases that you might have. Just to follow up on that, um, some of the best things you can do um, as part of like getting into exploratory testing is uh, once you know you started reading some of these things is to try it out uh, and to start to just get hands on. You know that the whole point of exploratory testing is to learn by doing. So um, look at find a find a cool website and set yourself some challenges to say something, um, give yourself a, a playground in which to, to say, you know, today I'm going to explore this page of this website with the accessibility tools to uncover information about how this page might not be accessible or using, um, you know, uh, accessibility heuristics that I might have Googled. Uh, heuristics are like little ways of working, things like Goldilocks, this is too big, this is too small, this is just right. Um, so things like that. Um, can really get you going and starting to understand okay how can i start to identify and see things um the real trick to exploratory testing is that there's no right or wrong way to really get going with it uh, lots of tools will tell you you've got to use this tool or you've got to use that tool really all you're doing is you're making a structured exploration of a bit of the software or a bit of the, the feature or program or whatever it is in order to uncover information about it that might relate to risks. Um, it's good practice to start learning how to take notes as you do it, because you're gonna to want to share that information with somebody at some point. Um, I like mind maps, um, but I've seen people video themselves. I've seen people use Google documents to do it. As long as you can find information, keep yourself um, in a good boundary so you're not just chaotically looking randomly you're you're focusing what you're doing and then you're taking notes so you can share that information that's a good place to get started and um, other tools for people to use are things like your peers if you go on ministry of test if you ask around at these sorts of events you're networking with people there will be people out there who'll be more than happy to pair with you and to, to showcase what they do and to share that information as well. And paired exploratory testing is a really good skill to have. Um, you can share that information face-to-face, -face, point of time. One person can be taking notes while the other person is driving the system and, and describing these things. Um, yeah, Shay's, Shay's point there of, of learning to take notes while exploratory testing, big, big, big thing. So just practice like using a site, thinking out loud, even if you're talking out loud to start saying, I'm going to click on this button because I wonder where it takes me. OK, and then taking those notes, that will get you a long way in exploratory testing as a starting point. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, real helpful, really good information. Thank you. No problems. Just to follow up on um, what Calm said, basically, um, I think he's what you've highlighted also there is utilization of your colleagues, um, right? So you've got your colleagues around and you can do all sorts of activities to sort of help you progress in your testing skill set. There's actually quite an awesome amount of games out there that you can use to play to uh, enhance the skill sets as well, right? Having those sessions, having taken an hour, maybe um, a week, um, and just 
you know, trying them out. I think one of the cool ones, I mean, it's not a game, but it is um, Test Sphere for um, restorming. That's another, you know, way you can basically, exactly, I've got a bunch of cards all the time with me. <laughs> you can use that to basically help you out to develop your um, different um, critical thinking in testing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you guys. <laughs>、um, can I take up the question around test cases or testing that was, or the, the observation around test cases or testing that was、um, offered up by Paul? Is that okay? Thank you, Callum.、Um, yeah, so、um, it's interesting. So for the first <laughs> X amount of my career, I started out in Microsoft where the mindset very much was. The more test cases you execute and、um, create, the more productive that you've been. And there were,、uh, there was a whole team called the quality team、um, who checked, reran random samples of test cases to make sure that they were followable and that they didn't throw up issues to make sure that the testing team had written them and had actually、um, executed them、um, to begin with. And I still, I kind of, I look back on that now and I th think there's a whole. Team devoted to that, and it wasn't like we had a regulatory or anything like that need to show an auditor the test cases. It was ju that's just the way things were back when the dinosaurs、um, roamed the earth and we all lived in caves and, and wore skins and did testing. But、um, it, it, it's funny, kind of. I had the feeling my whole, my whole career, even from like the first year or two, there has to be a better way to do this. Because the weird thing was, when I went and had a play with the system, which, you know, an unsophisticated, non evolved、um, attempt at exploratory testing, I found, I found more bugs than when I was writing test cases. So, how, how mad was that? Who knew that that would actually happen?、Um, so, I think a lot of testers felt the same way. So, when exploratory testing came along, people went, Yes, we can buy into this. We understand what this is. But the challenge was that we, and I count myself as part of this, the, the early adopters or the early explorers, we didn't know how to sell it. We didn't know how to bring people on board. So it was one day we're writing test cases, the next and not we're exploring. And, and our whole thinking about selling it was completely flawed. And I think we, Alienated people with our explanations of what exploratory testing was back in the early days. It was an absence of something rather than the presence of something. And I think, yeah, nowadays people just go, oh, so you don't write test cases. Well, well no, we, we explore meaningfully, we represent the user, we think about the complexity, we follow certain paths, we、um, apply context, we apply, apply domain knowledge, we have this whole world of stuff going on. And it's,、um, I don't know how to fix the marketing problem or the perception problem that the value of exploratory testing has. And, you know, I sometimes feel I owe the testing community a massive apology that I didn't do enough to sort of sell it as part of、um, the peer group that I was in at the time. But yeah, I, I would, if I had my time around again, if, you know, I could Dr. Hewitt and go back in time, I'd definitely, definitely go back to selling exploratory testing as the presence of something rather than the absence of something. So, Yeah, I haven't really answered your question massively. I'm sorry about that, but just you know, an observation of how we got to where we are. Just sorry, Cal. Oh, thank you. <laughs> just, just to jump in on that,、um, this type of testing where scripted testing s、um, is, is the sort of de facto for, for the types of testing, it definitely does come from、um, a lot of sources as well, such as、um, like your computer science degrees or, and so on. They will teach you that your, your way of testing will be、um, to unit test or, or scripted test. And it's a prevailing view that, that is happening across、um, the, the whole industry. And we're still today,、um, you know, it's been years of, of exploratory testing. We're still today having to sell that point.、Um, anytime I land into a new company, the first thing I have to do is go, so what's this exploratory testing thing? And it's teaching testers, it's teaching、uh, managers, it's teaching the developers, and slowly, incrementally building up that kind of view of, Here's testing. Here's what it looks like now. Here's how I can help you. Here's how it will give you information. So, selling it these days is definitely 
coming to somewhere, laying out your market stall and saying to people, here's how it will help you. And if you have to do that in an interview, <laughs> then you have to do that in an interview um, as well. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely, there's a, there's a perception problem um, and, and a sales problem because manual testing is de facto scripted. Um, and we have to build on that. Yeah, just, just, just to add to that, uh, Callum, I think one of the ways we've tried to look at it is trying to get talked about getting closer to the customer. So we do, we, we might do talk about doing like experiments in our production with our customers, throw out a, a variation of an idea out there, see what comes back. It's no different to what we're doing when we're doing exploratory testing, right? We're exploring, we're trying to find out ideas. We're trying to find out what may be good, what may be bad, what may work, what may not work. Um, and, you know, to be able to do that in a way that actually is in align with our customers and understanding our customers is really important. So I think coming back to your point, Elizabeth, we've just not sold it in that way before. It's really, we've just missed a trick because it's no different to a lot of what we do nowadays. You know, we, we've got so many experiments running on our, on our production uh, website right now, just seeing what comes back, right? And it's no different to us exploring a product when we're building it and putting it out there to see what, what, you know, what, how it works. So a lot of it is terminology, a lot of it is education. You know, and I think the more we can bring our customer into the view of what we do, and when I say our customer, uh, your people's understanding of what we're trying to represent in, in these roles as testers, we are trying to represent the customer. Therefore, you know, we need to explore it. We need to think like the customer. We need to think, hey, what if I do this? What if I do that? You can't script that stuff. And you know, I think if we're talking about automation is checking, scripted manual is checking that they're, they're the same things right it just you use a tool to automate it versus you're just following a script right so i think that's that's the big thing for me is you know trying to really just get people to understand that difference and why it's really valuable and if you've got if you've got teams that are running these experiments in production it's quite it is a nice in to have those conversations elsewhere as well so it's something to think about Definitely. But yeah, I think the, the, the scripted, we're trying to move away from, you know, writing scripts, but some people are very, it's their safety net. They do feel quite safe when they've written their scripts and they're going through them and it's their guideline. And that's not a bad thing because it, it gives them confidence of what they're doing. It's just trying to broaden their mindset to go wider. Yeah. But actually, yes, that, that's, that's checking. And actually, if you're going to check those things, you could automate them and then you can use your time to explore wider. So it's just trying to educate people differently around some, some of the, the terminology and the techniques that we've got. I think just to add um, a tiny bit of comment, because like I know in terms of marketing, it has been really, you know, marketed bad that, you know, automation will like replace um, all the different manual activities. And I've seen a lot of like different vendors like that's in their landing pages. And I think that's added to it, you know, that, OK, maybe because they've seen that, you know, automation can speed up things. Um, it's much cheaper to just buy you know, an offshore tool rather than an actual person to do the job, then I think that's where the whole, you know, um, problem, you know, started. So as an industry, I, I do believe that we have a lot of, you know, like education to do. And, um, you know, I think like, for example, now in terms of our role, like I firmly believe that we should, you know, be moving to a more of a quality advocate role, hence the meetup main group quality advocates so we're here to you know advocate that you know not everything is about automation you know not everything is about tools that it's about you know the actual human aspect of it because customers at the end of the day they're not going to care what automation tool you use if if they can't even you know um add like a shopping you know item on their cart like they don't care if you've used selenium they don't care if you've used cypress so we just need to put back the human aspect <laughs> side of it um yeah side of things that's brilliant i love that the human aspect side of things um so i've got a question I, i'm kind of turning this on its head and I, i'm going to ask everyone here a question so we're 
here we're selling, we're marketing, we're advocating for exploratory manual testing as a practice tester to tester. But, you know, going by the conversation that I'm seeing, we're preaching to the almost converted or the very converted at the moment. We're not the people that need to be persuaded. Now, we as a group of 32 people on this call, um, how do, how do we sell this in the large to the C-suite of businesses? How do we sell it to the development community? How do we sell it to the delivery community? So the delivery managers, the scrum masters, how do we sell it to all of them outside of this? How do we go big with this message? This is the, this is the, the question I'd like um, people to consider and, and, and not now, not answer now because you're not in an interview. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, I'd really like for 90% of the testers as a benchmark that come to me to know what exploratory testing is. That would be awesome. And then for I don't have to go into companies and have to sell them the value of having um, a cross-functional testing team that they just go, hey, here's what we want to build and we want to hire you to build it. How do we get to that point? I'd love to know that. So like to follow up on... Yeah, oh, sorry, you go on. No, no, go on, Alex. I was going to follow up on that and just say that basically this might be our core speaking, but um, it's a, a similar question. But um, I was thinking about how to remove, how do you remove manual from the actual testing part in the conversation um, on a higher level? For me personally, what I've been doing, and I basically stole it from Mr. Bolton, um, which is whenever someone has a conversation with me about, hey, can you do some manual testing? Which in my role, I don't really do much testing anyway, in terms of like the way you think it is like sitting there pressing on buttons. It's more about testing thought shifting left and trying to figure problems out exactly. <laughs> um, the way I kind of have a phrase that is, um, somebody goes, oh, how, do you, how are you going to do the manual testing here? I'm like, um, so I might do some exposure testing here. I might be doing some accessibility testing here. And I was like, yeah, but in manual set, it's like, if you avoid using that word and then actually pinpoint the different types of testing, like if there's non-functional requirements involved and you can think about different non-functional requirements, you don't have to remember them all. Just have a sticky note or something like lying around with a list or something. And if that helps you with thinking about different types of testing and brainstorming for yourself, then in that case, you can almost like after a while remove that word from vocabulary and if somebody goes to you like why do you not refer to manual testing and then I, in that case i can educate i will never force like in a passive aggressive way to say oh i'm deliberately not saying it it's just if somebody is interested i can educate them about it but i'm um, also go off and do some talks like this and preach to the choir i guess or the preach to the preachers with with regards to that um so yes and uh, to yes and it. um definitely um by saying is is it also worth educating on how manual testing is changing if we ignore the use of it if we hide behind as i was saying to, is my beginning point if we take it out of our lexicon we we lose the ability to to shape and control um what it means we are the testers we should educate on what it means we shouldn't let management we shouldn't let engineers we shouldn't let um well, we are engineers we shouldn't let development engineers uh, we shouldn't let um like hiring managers define what manual testing is we're the manual testers or, or we're the testers we'll define what manual testing is so when they say well what manual testing will you do say so, the types of manual testing that our approach may be. I'll take an exploratory route for here. Um, and then to do the scripted testing, we might push that to automated. Is that, um, you know, to actually claim ownership of that? Because I worry that we're too afraid of saying manual testing for fear that we're going to suddenly start to say, oh, if I say I'm manual testing in any way, shape, or form, I'm going to look less technical or, or less able as a tester. That's certainly not the case. We all know that. Let's um, take ownership of, of that term and, and say what it means in context of our project. Um, and yes, Kristen, you're right. We don't need to own testing, but we can own the narrative and we can own the championing of, of, of testing and, and what that means. Sorry, that was a, a misspeaking in my impassioned uh, way. <laughs> but yes, it's, it's everyone's responsibility, but, but we can own championing what that means and, and championing having that um, discussion to say, this is the ways I will be manual testing today and it will be exploratory. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, 
just to follow on from that, and Amit's actually made a comment here around way way I've tried to spin that script a little bit is actually remove away from talking about testing per se and talk about quality and the quality of what we're trying to deliver to our customers and the quality of what we want to deliver to our customers. We often get in this day and age, we're often getting caught in that, you know, deliver at speed and everything has to be done now, right? Now, 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 now. And it's actually coming back to, okay, we can do it now, but let's talk about what the customer needs. What Let's talk about the quality of what we need to deliver to our customer and actually how quickly do we really need to do it? Because, you know, technology allows us to go as quickly as we want to. Technology is not going to be the problem. It's our own minds and our own mindsets that are going to be the challenge. So bringing it back to the actual conversation around quality and the whole team ownership of quality, testing is a way that you can help identify the level of quality in the product that you're putting out there. It's not the only thing you can do. So, you know, when you start talking about quality, you take the lens off of purely testing and you actually open it up to wider discussions. So people, you know, when you say the whole team are responsible and you'll get your, you know, your product going, well, how am I responsible? Well, you bring to us what the customer you know, expectations are, for example, we'll talk to you about that. We'll learn from you. We'll, we'll test you, right? And, and ask you, is this really valid? Is this what you think? You know, and then the same thing with our developers and so on and so on and so on. And actually, as you start building that more united front around quality, then the, the whole testing thing becomes an easier conversation. Conversation. So pairing up, you know, having different conversations, the developers to generally start to become a bit more open about sitting together and talking about this stuff and so on. So that's how we've tried to approach it. And I've tried to do that more in a lot of the talks that I'm doing is talk about quality, but rather than testing, if you see what I mean. Yeah, and just to add as well from what everyone has said, so it's, you know, mainly the same, like I've taken the approach that, you know, everyone is responsible for testing, but I've also made it my point that in order for the developers to help me with testing and so I can focus on, you know, doing the other aspects of it, I need to introduce developer-friendly tools, and I think that is really key. Um and I'm I've 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 actually been reading a lot about um Alan um Alan Page uh, modern testing you know principles and you know I I believe that you know um most of the organizations will really try to get developers you know to own the testing and that doesn't mean that we're not needed um there's still a lot of other areas where we can you know convince you know where we can improve you know the quality aspect not just on you know doing functional testing we can think about you know how we can improve or how we can um like maximize you know the time it takes for a code to go on you know one build to another like like just in terms of you know like speeding up um but then not compromising quality so we have a lot of um inputs that we need to um to give you know on um, on that area but in order for us to be focused on that we need to really get the developers you know help and I found, you know, and this has been a success for me in a previous, you know, role that, you know, it, that um, every um, new tools that I've introduced, I've, I always have this mind that, okay, is, are, are the developers going to use this? Are they going to be um, like, um, like well fitted, you know, in using this tool or the documentation, you know, um, like up to date? And if, you know, if they're okay, in, you know, in using it, then I can, be um like really even like confident that i can focus on other things without you know compromising any of the other quality yeah great i mean it's um really good conversation we've got going here um i think this is probably a good time now um it seems like we've got some of you guys in the chat we've got the absolute eye of the tiger um so I think it's a really good time for us to open it up to the floor. Um, for any of you guys, if you've got any 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 comments of yourselves that you wanna you wanna bring bring to the bring to the the speakers. Um, yeah, please do speak up. It'd be great to great to hear your your points of views outside of the chat, obviously. Um, so yeah, please please do please do speak up now if if you've got anything you'd like to say to the group. Um, I suppose, sorry, I'll jump in here, uh, Marco, apologies. Uh, I am still here, guys, and my camera was broken, so I was on camera earlier, but now it's not. So uh, um, I just want to say thanks all for all your, uh, you know, really um, interesting points of view and, and sort of experiences throughout it. Um, I guess, you know, what I'm sort of 
coming on for is that you know I'm currently um, unemployed. I uh, I've been testing for sort of nearly seven years um, across two large companies and um, generally focusing on the manual testing and UAT user acceptance testing and sort of you know building that out. Um, in my latest round of sort of job searches, I have really struggled to find any job that I felt confident enough to apply for due to the lack of automation experience. You know, every single testing job that I've seen has some sort of automation on there. And regardless of whether it's a large or small part, obviously from my side of things, I'm like, I don't have it, so therefore I'm not gonna go for it. And um, so I've actually now sort of moving into a different world, which is uh, which is sort of slightly surprising. But as I said, I completely agree with all, everything you guys are saying. It's yeah, it's trying to work out how we can get that out there that, you know, just because someone doesn't, a tester doesn't have automation does not mean they're not a tester and therefore not valuable to your business. I would just want to follow up on that, actually, Richard, and, and I'm going to put Marco on the spot a little bit here. So obviously we're talking about how can we educate, you know, the, the powers that be in our organisations. But Marco, from a recruiter's perspective, you having these conversations with, you know, companies, with people that want to recruit, how are you trying to, you know, level their heads off a little bit around some of the, the, the requirements of these unicorns that, you know, people are going after? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question. I think certainly a lot of my job is managing expectations. Uh, and, and like you say, when, when a client comes to us or a customer comes to us and is, um, and is saying, you know, we want, a unicorn so to speak a lot a lot of a lot of my job is managing that expectation and, and actually and actually kind of making aware of what is actually out on the market um now obviously i spend most of my days speaking to, to both candidates and clients alike and um having quite similar conversations to what we're having tonight in in terms of making sure that it, you know the realism of, of kind of the current situation is is made clear to everybody so when when somebody comes to me saying you know we we would only look at somebody who's who's got 15 years of automation experience there's a certain part of it sort of like okay well is that realistic is, is that actually is that actually what your business needs um but i also think you know especially with this um current time that we're going through now it's a real learning curve for both clients and well companies and and candidates as well in terms of how they can one put themselves across and two what it is that the business needs to be able to, to survive because a lot of a lot of companies are in survival mode so they are kind of looking at people in terms of what is it that's going to fix the problem at the moment because you know it's, it's it's tough out there for a lot of businesses um and yeah I, I think it is a learning curve at the moment i think patience is very much the word um the word on the street from from both sides i don't know if that's i don't know if that answers your question yeah I, i'm just i'm just curious in the sense of it's something that i've been Think, you know, we've, I've done a lot of recruitment over the last 12 months and you know in terms of how we pitch a role how we you know the profile of a role we, we've been very torn in terms of you know trying to put the role out there so it's it's appealing to people and there's it's visually opportunity there to grow and learn new skills and so on and so on but also not to put people off coming to, to Rich's point so it's just trying to figure out that balance because ultimately you, know, you don't need to have all these skills to be able to come in and start doing this role but you could build on these and you know learn these skills once you're in the role so it's just trying to and obviously those conversations the sort of conversations i would have with you right marco in terms of you know yeah. the you know, this is i this is what the role um uh, is is there for but ultimately you know these are the key skills that we're looking for and that's mindset so on and so on um, and so, but I'm, I'm just coming back to Richard's point, you know, he's nervous about applying for roles because he doesn't think he's got those skills. How can we bridge that gap? How can we get people more confident to go, actually, I can apply for that role, even if I don't have X, Y, and Z? Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think at the moment, I guess it's quite important to, to, to say as well, the market now is different to how it's ever been. Um, probably probably in the last five to ten years certainly and when it comes to any job being being available the market is so flooded with not just candidates but great candidates um you know to, to the point where even if there is a job that is perfect for somebody with the right experience level that they're asking for 
because of the situation we're in at the moment, there's actually people who are at the level above and the level above that who've been on the market for such a long time that they're looking to come down and be like, okay, I just need a job now. So it's made it's made almost a little bit of a clog in a clog in the system for when for when jobs do come available, which has certainly made it a little bit harder. Um, and, and actually, I think you know companies themselves are a little bit confused, and it's almost like when you go when you go shopping and you go out to buy. A, you know a bag of oranges and then you walk you come to the supermarket and you, you know you immediately see a 24 pack of crisps which is on sale and you're like oh what you know what i could get i could get that actually i hadn't come here for that but that's what's come across so i, I think there's a level of confusion in the market and i think that message is, is uh, in terms of what companies are actually looking for has become a little bit skewed um but again anyone who's not anyone who's not working at the moment my best advice i can give to anybody is stay active if, if if you can, if you can add to your CV, if you can add to your your skill set, do it. There's loads of online courses. Um, I think the Open University is one of them that's offering um, free online courses. LinkedIn has got loads of free online courses, and they're just extra things that you can keep adding to your CV and you can keep adding to your to your skill set. Just to jump on that, especially as somebody who who is very um sort of like historically very manually focused and um, wanted to showcase some of these skills um, in a technical um, standpoint. Um, the Postman tool is an amazing tool that will allow, that a lot of us use when we're doing our API testing, uh, even manually and exploring things. And that has the capability in it to add tests against um, API endpoints. And you can also start to run them through um, scripts, code commands, um, line tools via the Newman runner. And you can also plug them into things like K6 for your load testing and you could automate things. If you can use Postman to like manually to um, do calls and requests uh, and check those things, you can start adding tests to them. It's also got little snippets in there. Uh, you can just pull the tests in um, from their uh, tool itself. So that's the simplest and easiest way to get into automation there. Yeah, there's um, there's three things that have been said there, which um, if anybody sort of comes to me and asks about, okay, uh, how do I get myself uh, my next role, um, are really important, and it all stems around brand. So, Marco, you said you said stay active, and that's absolutely right. You need to be able, you need to be ever moving forwards and trying to voice that. So there are forums out there that where you where you know. Twitter, um, Slack channels, et cetera, et cetera, where you can talk about what you're learning and that'll get you more, um, get you into in front of more people. Learning to use tools like Postman and having that on your on on your CV and being, you know, you, you can talk around it in an interview situation where you say, hey, look, I'm, I'm learning this. I'm really enthusiastic about it. I've, I've taken this website and I've actually learned how to, how to automate it through Postman uh, on my own. And people will be impressed by that. Test Automation University is a great one to jump on and, and get some basic skills. Again, again it's one of those things. Have it, you can have it on your CV that you're working on it. And you, you can even have that as a point on your CV. I am proudly learning automation so I can understand, I can broaden my skills. There are ways to have automation in your CV, Postman in your CV, APIs in your CV, where you're just learning it and that gets you in there. Once you're in there, it's about selling your brand. And if you think of yourself as a brand and not sort of like in a, in a, in a phone call where you're like trying to go, hey, um, it's, it's me here. But if you step back out of yourself and you say, I'm, Sh I'm, I'm selling Shay to these people, that, that can help. So those, those are the sort of three areas that I, I, I focus on with people. So um, I hope that might help you a bit there, Richard. Yeah, and no, absolutely. anyone else for that matter. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, gonna say I'm not the only one, I hope. Uh, but no, appreciate that. No, absolutely. I suppose my only sort of chance back to that, and I, I guess as me as a person, I completely appreciate what all of you are saying. But I thought the point here was that, you know, a manual tester is a manual tester. So what you said then is, you know, go on Postman and start learning automation and put that on your CV and then you become an automated tester in my mind. Obviously, sort of what I'm, you know, as I said, in me personally, I'm not interested in that, which is why I've sort of taken a, a different direction at this moment in time, because I'm not an automated tester and it's not something I'm interested in doing. But that's where, you know, the job sort of was forcing me to take that route. You know, you don't have a choice of just being a manual tester. You have to be a Swiss Army knife and have you know, all the arrows in your quiver, etc. cetera. It, yeah, it's not about becoming technical though. Uh, so uh, just, I'll, I'll shut up in a second. It's not about sort of becoming um, proficient in, the, in these um, areas. You, you still 
quite often run an API call manually through Postman, things like that. So I'm not saying run out and become an automation engineer. I'm saying run out and understand the technology so then you can talk a bit better about it. And that's, and that's where I'm coming from. Um, yeah, absolutely yeah. though, yeah, it's, I, I can see where, where that can, where, where that, that misunderstanding happens, sorry. Um, can I take um, Mike's question that this is the route to IMN automation tester? So Elizabeth, just before you do, I think um, Christian uh, Phil was going to ask something or say something. Yeah, far away, Christian. Sorry. Um, I was just going to um, say something to Richard, which is a sort of another route that you could take if you if you want to stay if you, if you're really really into um, the more kind of creative side of testing and not not that enamored with learning automation um, uh, then there are very interesting courses um, which um, you could so there's um what's called the black box software testing course which is run out of the associate uh, the association for software testing and um, those courses in, in themselves are very um, uh, are, are quite challenging and really interesting for people. It, it, it's not about automation at all. It's about thinking, thinking, testing, creative testing. But more than that, um, you can go on and do instructing. So essentially, you can you can start teaching other people about testing through that route, and okay. that that can then give you a route into um, coaching or mentoring or um, training or you know, all sorts of other areas once you start you know, working with, on that sort of instructing. Um, no, that's really helpful. Thank you. I'm and, 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 and the other thing about that is if you go there and you don't have the support of your company, you can um, hunt around and see if there are scholarships available for those. They're really generous that way. Okay, brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you, Kristen. I'll, I'll um, stop now. Thank you. Uh, I, I believe Callum has got to drop off now, uh, but I'm sure everyone will join me saying thank you to Callum um, for his for his insight today. It's been it's been great having him on. Um, I'm sure you'll see him again in Quality Advocates and or other meetups somewhere in the meetup sphere soon. Um, but thanks very much, Callum. Uh, any other any other points? That thank you for that for Rich as well and and from from people who pitched in there it's, it's great to see people um getting involved and actively looking to try and help people it's it's certainly something which i think um we need more of and and, and you know yeah great, it's great great to see um any other any other points from 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 the um oh i think shay's off as well goodbye to shay thank you uh thank you for, for your input shay as well great to have you on um panel any other thoughts that you want to add all at once Elizabeth, were you going to say something? Or, uh... Yeah, sorry, I was just scrolling back to, um, to find Mike's question. So Mike passed the observation that um, learning tools like Post Postman might be the route to I am an aut automation tester when you're not or don't want to be. So the nice thing about Postman, and I use it as what I call a gateway drug for people who want to familiarise themselves with um, automated checks is that you do not have to understand a language in order to get started with Postman. It has pre, as long as you understand HTTP and HTTPS requests and responses, it has pre-formatted snippets of code and you just basically fill in what applies to your API and endpoints. And you can base, with, with a good tutor helping you, you can be up and running in Postman with about 15 minutes and it's not an automation tool. It's a tool to reveal information to make um, checking what's going on with your endpoints that little bit faster. But it's it's you know by no means a th the same level of uptake and investment in yourself that you'd have to put in to learn something like Cypress or Jest or anything like that. So it's it's a tool in your armory rather than going deep into automation. Like to add to this, um, you don't need to um, use any tools, for instance, for API stuff, just um, out of the box browsers have a 
especially Chrome, has an amazing set of tools. Uh, Google provides an amazing set of uh, courses online. Just Google it and you'll find like how you can uh, query APIs, block APIs, block requests, do performance testing. There's a built-in uh, lighthouse, I think, in there. There's so much you can do. Like, I think if you look at Chrome and you look at other browsers, they're all based on Chromium. So if you start investigating, you'll find that most of the high level testing that you could do on Chrome will be cover your Firefox, Edge, and whatever other Chromium based uh, browsers there are. There's some difference, I think, in caching probably, but um, you could find, like, you could just use basically Chrome to do a lot of stuff. There's plugins, add ons to um, also format your JSON API response. So you can literally just search for, like, do a request for API in, in the thing and respond, it'll format it for you. So I use it for exposure for testing that way as well. Like, I don't leave the browser most of the time. I'm like, oh, I can just do this. Obviously, if there's a server-side rendering and if you're wondering what that is, and if your technology uses server-side rendering or client-side rendering, then in that case, you need to be looking at this stuff and you need to be talking to your developers to understand how you could be testing those layers and what tools you could be using to test those layers. And so I think it's Richard Bradshaw and um, Mark Winterham. I think they do a great uh, blogs and talks about different uh, layers that you could do testing. Um, look them up, it'll be very useful. You don't need to be a test automation expert. You can just be a toolsmith expert with exploratory testing as a, as a driving skill set. Just to follow up on that, I think one of the things that is quite challenging um, in the industry right now is that people are, are, are just focusing on the, the technical skills to, to be able to do something and not really understand why they're doing it. So for me, you know, even if you aren't a, a technical hands-on type person, and, you know, let's face it, not everybody's got the want and desire to, to write some code, right? I mean, my want and desire to do that left me quite a while ago. Um, which is why I'm where I am where I am now. But, you know, if you understand why you, you may automate something, how, how you could do it, and, you know, the different types of approaches to, you know, to using technology, doesn't mean you have to be hands-on in, in actually implementing that kind of thing, because strategically you can help with those conversations. So, you know, that's really, really important. So, you know, we work in technology. Technology moves forward so quickly. We have to evolve. It's natural, right? We're not going to be able to sit around and stay the same forever and expect the same result. But you don't have to, you know, embed yourself into the world that is writing code, you know, be becoming an automation engineer. But you can learn a lot about it still and, you know, be able to support those types of conversations with your teams and, you know, help them in the direction that they need to go. So that's something else to think about as well. And just to add up as well, um, there's other types of testing where, you know, um, doing it manually is still like the good way forward. So if you want to focus on accessibility or, you know, security testing, yes, there are tools that, you know, can automate some of it, but it can only really catch, you know, like 20 to 40% of the issue. So you still have to do a lot of exploratory, a lot of actually using like different types of tools. So you don't just have to limit yourself in just like functional testing. There's other areas where and I think um, it's it's actually more um, like emphasized nowadays because we're all working from home and you know there's a big um, like there's a big push for companies to do accessibility so you know with accessibility um, we can automate some of them yeah but um, it's it's not the same as actually doing you know accessibility testing yeah Question. Have we got any other questions from uh, from the audience? Um, any other thoughts? Any other um, points that we want to get out? Um, panel, have you, have you have you exhausted your your testing minds? <laughs> Squeeze everything out of the sponge. I'd be keen to hear if anyone else has any sort of points of view uh, here about either manual exploratory or any other type of testing, and you know, their experiences. Not to put anyone on the spot. 
I was going to say Marco knows I'm always happy to talk, but I'll stay quiet for this one. Easily muted, Richard. Um, <laughs> just a joke. Uh, if uh, if we haven't got any other questions or any other points to ask, then um, yeah, uh, we, we're always always happy to end now. Um, panel, um, any final final points you want to put across? Um, any su summarising points, maybe? My quick summary point is um, self improvement, continuous self improvement. Just keep doing that step at a time. Um, take breaks because uh, you can burn out quite easily. That's very important. Um, it's all about well being these days or always. Um, and it doesn't matter if you go into, I mean, if you go and find a place where you finally get a job, um, advocate for quality, advocate for all different types of quality. A still plug for you, Marco. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, um, in, yeah, it's, it's really critical. And I think, um, I think there's a sort of a comment before in terms of like burning out in terms of like having to fight. I don't think for me personally, it's not a fight, uh, for me, it's a, it's a passion and a pleasure to sort of educate in quality and testing. Um, so I'm quite happy to share my thoughts about it. So I think at some point you will sort of, um, if you just keep building that up, it will become internalized and it'll become easy, like a second breath for you to talk about your belief in quality and your belief in testing and how it should be. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, are we are we happy to have let Oleg have the final say there? Um, I think he said it as, as, as good as anybody. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just follow up on it and just say, let's talk about quality. Right, this is quality advocates. There's a reason we call it quality advocates. And let's try and get the terminology out there to talk and focus our, our companies, our teams on, on quality rather than specifically testing. And that may hopefully help some of these more challenging discussions moving forward. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think certainly um, the kind of format that we've had tonight is 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 what I'm looking to do more of. Um, so if you've if you've enjoyed it, yeah, please please do come along to, to the next ones. I'll probably try and do the monthly, um, similar type of panel panel format with kind of interactive interactive questions. Um, uh, I should also say before we go, Marie Marie's got her her blog as well, um, and and Stuart also runs uh, another meetup called Tactful, which is a great meetup. So please please do um, give them your time as well because if uh, you've probably seen tonight, they've bags of knowledge um which is which is more than worth tapping into um uh, and, and i guess I, everyone in the audience will, will join me in thanking all the panel um it's, it's been great to hear all their insights and their experience it's um i mentioned before it was a joy to work with them in planning this so um yeah hopefully we'll see them in, in some meetups um again with quality advocates moving forward um and thank you everybody else for for attending um really uh, re really great to see See you guys here for the first of the year. Hopefully there'll be a few more. Should be another one in another month or so. Um, so yeah, um, if you have any other questions, either for me or the panel directly, um, please do feel free to reach out for us. Um, we're all on LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, but th thanks for coming. Marco, can I make a quick closing comment if it's okay? So there's been a lot of chat around, you know, do I follow automation? Do I stick with exploratory? How do I find exploratory roles? Um, so if I was kind of millionaire, uh, fucking Mark Zuckerberg type person, I'd go, hey, follow your passion because I'm a millionaire and I'm already here and I think everyone should follow their passion. I'm not going to do that. Explore all aspects of your job, okay? Explore the exploratory side. Explore the getting close to the business analysis side. Explore the tool side. Fuck it. Take a look at the automation side. You've heard people go, oh, it's hard. It's not for us. We shouldn't be indulging in the code or whatever. Have a bloody go and see what happens, okay? Explore explore your job options like you would an exploratory tester would explore the product that's in front of them, okay? All right, you know, be the bloody tiger in your own life. Lead the charge out there, okay? That's what I'm going to say. And, and if anybody sort of wants any advice about how to go down any of these paths, um, or, you know, reach out to any of the panelists on this panel. They're all awesome people. They will all help you with a path through the jungle. Okay, that's it. That's my, uh, that's my final comment. Thank you. And Marco's muses himself. Yeah, I just want to stay out of the way. Sorry. Yeah, um, <laughs> causing trouble. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, have a great evening. Hope you have a good weekend um, after tomorrow, obviously. Um, yeah, we'll see you at the next one.
Yeah, thanks, Marco. Thanks all. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for the brilliant thanks audience. Everyone. Thank you. Seven and six. Right, that was what there was one person left in which stopped the recording.